Hello, and welcome to the Motorsport Magazine podcast in association with Mercedes Benz. Great design is not only how things look, but also how well they work. The new GLC Urban Edition, now from £349 per month for a limited time only. Now, we are at the Royal Automobile Club in Epsom because today is the Motorsport Hall of Fame Awards. And the benefit of that, or one of the many benefits, I should say, is that we often get guests coming over who we have been trying to get podcasts with for quite a while. And one of those is John Fitzpatrick. So, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Um, Pleasure to be here. Good. I'm glad, uh, glad you've made it. So, um, how often do you come over to England again? I know you live... Well, we, s- we spend the summers here. Uh, so much going on in the summer. You know, yeah. Goodwood, Silverstone, all sorts of things. This, uh, I, you know, meet up with my friends. Yeah. Uh, and then try and get away somewhere in the winter where it's not quite so cold. Yeah. And you live close to quite a lot of old friends. When you go uh, back to America, yes, in fact, in America, I live close to Brian Redman and David Hobbs, so uh, yep. we meet up all the time and have fun and tell each other how good we used to be <laughs> <laughs> or how good we wish you used yeah. to be. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we get on to your own career, I was hoping to go back to Monaco, 1961, and your you watched something quite special. I did. Uh, I was. Uh, I was 18 at the time. I'd already, I, I'd already got a, a mini, and I was, I'd done one or two little driving tests and things. But uh, my father took me down to uh, Monaco to the Grand Prix, yep. and uh, I saw Sterling Moss win uh, in the Lotus, beat the three Ferraris, and uh, actually happened to be staying in the same hotel as Sterling Moss, wow. and was able to meet Sterling Moss only briefly, but. Uh, it, and it was a, a fabulous experience, and it, that's what really turned me on to motor motor racing. Yeah, yeah. And was, what do you remember of the, his sort of performance? Because it was such a now it's such an iconic race, and well, it was. I mean, it was. Uh, it was. It was. It was a fantastic performance. I mean, the the car was nowhere near as quick as the Ferraris, but uh, you know, Sterling he, he just outdrove them, and that was it. And yeah. it was very very impressive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. Yeah. And uh, from there, you went quite quickly into motorsport and you were partnered, you were driving with the likes of Paddy Hopkirk, Sir John Whitmore, and but in only a few years, maybe three years, was it? Uh, well, yeah, the, uh, the year after going to Monaco, I did one or two club races in my Mini and did, uh, did well. I was successful with it. And uh, John Whitmore was leaving the Works Mini Cooper team to go to Ford. And he suggested to John Cooper that I might take his place. He'd seen me in some club races. And uh, I had a call from the great John Cooper, wow. who invited me down to Surbiton t- and asked me if I'd like to drive for them. And I tried sort of not to snap his hand <laughs> off. It was very polite. And I remember he was a wonderful guy. I remember going through the door and he greeted me as he said, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and I was only 19 at the time. Mr. Fitzpatrick, very nice to meet you. He was a really, really nice man. Took me in the workshop. In the workshop, I saw Bruce McLaren there, and uh, they were building their cars for the Tasman. Yeah. And, and it was just a fantastic experience. Wow. And it was, how did what happened between that and to get a Works Cooper's drive? Well, that was it. He's invited me there to give me a Works Cooper drive. John Whitmore told him that I was good in the minis. They were looking for a mini driver. And uh, I walked out that day with a contract. I signed it, but I had to get it countersigned by my parents because I was less than 21 years old. But uh, yeah, he offered it me on the spot. Uh, he paid me £100 a race, which was unbelievable. Right. And uh, that, that was it. I, that's, that got me started. And you were lead driver to Paddy Hopkirk? Well, I wasn't lead driver. Paddy and I, uh, uh, you know, we raced against each other. He did one or two rallies and had to miss one or two events. So I really was sort of the favoured driver to get the points. And I finished uh, uh, I finished second in the championship behind Jim Clark. And of course, the, the, the other wonderful thing was that I'd seen Jim Clark racing in Monaco yeah. that year. And uh, 
the very first race I did in the, in the Mini Cooper, uh, it was pouring with rain for practice. I went out to the sort of collection area, drove out, went to go out on the track, and I'm there right next to Jim Clark in the Lotus School team. Oh, wow. And it was, up, it was just tremendous. I got out of the car, and he got out, and it was raining a bit. And he, he came over and I said, oh, this isn't too good, is it? You know, the rain. He said, John, he said, he said, you've got to just take advantage of the fact that it's raining. He said, because nobody else likes it. He said, and he actually said to me, do yourself a favor, go over to Zandvoort and go to Robbie Slotomarker's skid school. Apparently he'd been there the year before, believe it or not. Right. And he said, it's the most incredible experience. It'll teach you to drive in the wet. And from then on, you'll love the wet. And in fact, I did that within a f couple of months. And uh, from then on, I just loved the wet. It was, yeah. a, you know, it was an advantage. It was fantastic. Was it the sa that same year when you overtook Hans Hermann at the Nürburgring in the mini <laughs> chasing down some a -buffs and <laughs> Yeah, that was something else. It was a... Uh, 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 that's right. It was it was a Downton Mini, in fact, not a Broadspeed Mini. It was right. a Downton Mini, and a German guy that I'd got to know had ordered it, and uh, he asked me if I'd do the 500 Ks at the Nurburgring with him in a Mini. I, in a Mini Cooper S, yes. Just and all the the, the main opposition were the Arbath sports cars, and uh, I think there were two or three Minis there, but uh, there were dozens of these Arbath sports cars, and we were we were about seventh or eighth ninth on the grid i don't remember exactly but uh there again it uh, it rained it was raining at the start of the race yeah and uh i'd been to the nurburgring the year before so i knew the track quite well and i just sort of picked my way past and finally overtook hans herman going down the, down the hill down the twisty bits and uh, he overtook me again on the straight he came over <laughs> the line first but in fact hans uh, Hans became a great friend as well, and every time I see him, he reminds me <laughs> of me overtaking him on the outside in the wet downhill at the Nurburgring. Wow, you, you don't think of minis and the Nurburgring. Like you, we often think you look you, when you think of a mini, you think of it slightly sideways at Goodwood or Snetterton. Yeah. You don't picture it on the Nurburgring. What's it like driving a mini around? Well, it, it's just one great. Bi it's it's almost like uh, having uh, what five or six brands hatch <laughs> brands hatches all sort of. <laughs> <laughs> one after the yeah. other and uh, it, it, it's fabulous I mean the car was just absolutely sensational but it's such a long straight there that of course everything just you gained on the corner you lost <laughs> on the straight but yeah, it was good fun and uh, I, I, I mean I, I love the Nürburgring uh, I've done I think 80 no I've done 40 races at the Nürburgring and uh, I've, I think I've had about eight or nine wins at the Nürburgring, wow. so it's absolutely my favourite circuit. In fact, uh, as I often say this to people, that uh, if I have trouble getting to sleep at night, <laughs> I put my head on the pillow and I drive around the Nürburgring. Really? And I've never got halfway around. I'm always Brilliant. fast asleep before I get to uh, Brightscheid. What, what's your car of around. choice? Oh, I don't even think about the car. <laughs> I just sit there in the corners and... Uh, it's great because you went all over the world with, with Mini. You went to even to Australia. To compete yeah, with I Mini. did. Uh, a BMC sent us at the end of that year. I drove for Coopers. They sent us out to uh, to do the uh, uh, which not it, it wasn't uh, Bathurst. It was in Melbourne at Sandown, yeah. the six hours of Sandown. And Paddy and I drove, and Timo and Rano went as well. I mean that Timo and Rano were well. Rano's fairly wild, but Timo is completely <laughs> wild. And we did a tour of all the big towns in Australia promoting the uh, the minis. Excellent. You know, doing sort of 360s and all that sort of thing. Brilliant. Yeah. Going sideways. Yeah. All the way. Exactly. Yeah. When you were at Cooper, you still never got to drive a Cooper single-seater, though. Is that, is that true? Uh, well, Ken Tyrrell was running the Work Mini Cooper team, and he was running the, the Formula 3 team with uh, with Jackie. Yeah. And in the uh, when I went down... To to drive the car for the first time, which was I think February, March uh, in that year, uh, to test the car, uh, I was there in the paddock, sort of waiting to go out. And uh, Ken had the Formula Three car there, and Jackie Stewart arrived. He'd driven down from Scotland, and that was his first test drive with Tyrrell. Right. And oh. Bruce McLaren was there, and uh, Bruce took the Formula Three car out, and then Jackie took it out, and first time in the single seater 
took it out, went a bit faster. So Ken said to Bruce, you better go out and go a bit faster. And really all morning, that's exactly what happened. Wow. Every time Bruce got in the car, it went faster. Jackie went faster still. And uh, I saw a lot of that going on. Of course, I was testing the, the Mini in the, in the meantime. Yeah. And uh, so I had the pleasure of meeting Jackie uh, in his first day. And then when Jackie, when Jackie uh, uh, retired from Formula 3 at the end of the year, Ken was looking for another driver. Right. Uh, Jackie had driven with Warwick Banks, and at the end of the year, they, they both pulled out. And Ken asked me if I'd like to drive the Formula 3 car. Right. And I wasn't, I mean, I, it wasn't my ambition to be a, a single-seated driver or a Formula 1 driver. I just love what I'm doing. But I said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'll try it. And he gave me the opportunity. And I did a, I did a test day at the end of the year. It was raining. Uh, it was at Goodwood. Uh, I had a spin and sort of brushed the car against the bank and I sort of hurt my back a little bit and I thought, um, I, this isn't for me and I just never pursued it. Yeah. And uh, But Ken gave me the chance and in fact, even after that day, if I'd said yes, I could have done it, but I didn't. Right. But I think it's probably the best choice you made because you got to drive so many great cars afterwards and then even became Jackie's teammate at Cologne. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. A few years later, we both drove for Ford Cologne in the in the Capris, and uh, I mean, Jackie had hardly he'd hardly done any touring car racing for a long, long time. Yeah. And uh, he came over to the Nurburgring, and I think we had three cars, and there was Jochen Mats and uh, Gerard Larousse, Dieter Glemser, and uh, Jackie just hopped in and went quicker than everybody. Really? Yeah. It was just uh, it was it was amazing. And uh, but it was oh, and, uh, the other funny thing was that we had Emerson in the team as well. Yes. I don't think it ever raced a touring car, and he right. hated it. He absolutely hated it, and uh, he he really uh, he, he just didn't like it at all. And the, the funny thing happened with Emerson was that we were staying in a uh, in a hotel in the, the woods about 20 miles away in the forest, right. uh, sort of an old castle, and uh, it was a long drive to the track and Ford had laid on a helicopter. So we were being taken in this helicopter from the hotel over to the Nürburgring. And uh, I think it, w it was quite a big hel helicopter because I think there were three or four of us in it as, as well as the pilot. And the very first morning, I went in first, I think with Jerry Birrell and uh, Emerson and Jackie. Right. Emerson hated every minute of it. <laughs> he was sick when we landed and he refused to get in the helicopter for the rest really? of the, the other three days. So he, every morning and every night, he drove to and from the ring around these twisty roads 20 miles away and we all just sort of winged it in the helicopter. Brilliant. Yeah. But that, the Capri was quite a bad car from what I've, what I've read. I think you called it... Um, well, it, it was a... Yeah, it, it's, it was a very different... I found it a difficult car to drive. It didn't handle well. It was very, very, very bad. The following year, they improved it quite a lot. Right. Uh, the guy who developed it originally, he left to go to BMW, uh, Martin Braungart, and the BMW is absolutely fantastic. But they lost their way with the Capri, and it really was hard work, and it, it just wasn't competitive yeah. with the BMWs. And Jackie hated it as well, didn't he? Jackie never said he hated it. I don't think Jackie would have said so anything <laughs> like that. He just sort of got on with it. Right. But certainly between us, we agreed that it was hard work and, right. you know, it could have been a lot better. I think I read somewhere that you said uh, it wasn't quick enough to be scary. Even. Uh, I don't remember saying <laughs> that, but that's probably very true. Right. I mean, we were, uh, we certainly weren't. I, I did, I won one race with it. Uh, with Dieter Glemster at the Salzburg Ring. And we won it because a couple of the BMWs had a few problems, but we did win. I won one race with it, so right. I can't write it off completely. <laughs> but you almost joined the, end, the BMW at the end of that year when you were buying a CSL? Well, actually, th yeah, I did. That was, that was actually the year before I drove for Cologne. At the end of the previous year, they'd announced the CSL and I decided to buy one. Right. And uh, Kronofus asked me to, uh, go and see him at uh, uh, at Cologne, uh, which I did, and uh, he offered me a contract for the following year. And because it was a works Ford contract, it was quite reasonable, 
good good money, not what you do, it was good money. Yeah. And I signed the contract, went down to Munich to pick up my car. And uh, the girl at the sort of customer delivery place said, oh, before you go, Mr. Nearpash would like to speak to you. So he just moved to BMW yeah. from Ford. And uh, the previous year, I'd driven the Escorts, and he'd been running the Ford Cologne sports uh, effort. And uh, so I went to see him, and uh, we had a little chat, and then he put this thing across the table, this piece of paper, and he said, I'd like you to drive for me next year. Uh, you know, here's a contract. And I said, oh, Jochen, you know, if only I'd come here yesterday. Yeah. Last night I signed a contract with Granifus <laughs> to drive for Ford, and uh, so I couldn't do it. And you might have got a free car as well. Well, yeah, that, <laughs> that, 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 that helped as well, but it made up for it. But, uh, yeah, that was a missed opportunity. But racing's like that. I mean, I had lots of missed opportunities, but I had lots of good luck as well. Yeah. So I can't really complain. And when you were with Ford... Um, I was reading your book about the many trips, the sort of team building trips that you'd go on in fitness camps. Uh, yes, Jochen uh, Nierpa started that uh, when I was previous year when I was driving the Escort for Ford Cologne. He started that, and we we used to go down to uh, we went to St Moritz. We had a fitness trainer, spent a week down there, and a big part of it was cross country skiing, which is very you know very hard work, great fit, uh, fitness building, yeah. and. Uh, and then he carried that on when he went to BMW, and in fact Ford carried it on as well. Uh, so that's, and then uh, th that got me training at home. So I used to, I used to run two or three times a week, you know, four or five miles, right. know, just to keep fit. Because the, in those days, the, the, the touring cars were really, you know, they were pretty exhausting to drive, yeah. heavy on the steering. Actually, the BMW eventually wasn't. The BMW was, in fact, the BMW was probably the best touring car I ever drove. It was fabulous. It really was well balanced. And but I, in the earlier days, they were very, very hard work. And then, of course, I got onto the Porsches and the turbos, and and then the ground effects. So you really did need to be fit. Was that the beginning of kind of driver fitness in a way? Did they want to think about it before then? No, they didn't. Uh, no, th they didn't. It was a surprise to us when Jock and Nierpash asked us to do it. And, of course, we all loved it. It was great. And we had a bit of fun while we were there as well. And, uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, that stood me in really good stead. And, uh, yeah, I think it just developed from there. You had some, scrape near, some, some scrapes when you were skiing as well. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> I did have a, a bit of a scrape. I was with... Uh, Hans Heyer was part of the Ford team, and uh, I mean, we weren't supposed to be out there skiing properly. Right. We were doing cross-country skiing, but then in the afternoon, when we were sort of having a rest, one or two of us had, had get the proper skis, and we got up the top and come down. And one day, Hans and I were thrashing down the mountain, and he went one side of this big rock, and I went the other, and we met on the other side. And we both sort of had to gather ourselves up, and Brilliant. blood coming out of here. And, and uh, we got away with it, though, fortunately. Did he have his hat on, or did he not? Uh, no, he, I, I don't think I ever saw Hans without his hat. No. Only very briefly, when he took it off to put the helmet on. Right. But that was his trademark, wasn't it? Yes. And yeah. he covered with his lots of little badges everywhere he'd been. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, talking of uh, team building, actually. Uh, talking of team building. Actually, uh, team building yeah. links nicely with uh, Mercedes Benz' latest offer. Um, here, I should give a quick word for word to, um, because our podcast sponsors Mercedes. Um, they have a new team building team away day um, experience at the Mercedes Benz World, um, and you can do four by four blindfold driving. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wow. Beat the clock um, and various others. And they're currently offering 25% off. Uh, and all you need to book to do to book is call 01932 373 707 or visit the Mercedes-Benz World website. Uh, and that offers on until the 7th of September. Um, so we will put a link in the bottom of the description of this video and on the podcast. So you can also take advantage of that. But yeah, so skiing. And that's in the UK, is it? Only in the UK, at Brooklands. Yeah, OK. So, oh, very interesting. Uh, which is yeah. a nice a nice yeah. day out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, But I want to talk to you about Rolf Stommelen. Yes. Because yes. to speak to any racing driver of who was around in the 70s, even 60s, he's always comes, always comes up as the fastest man and yeah. the best man to be around. 
what was it like driving with Rolf? Yeah, yeah he was uh, he, he was a very very nice guy and uh, I first met him uh, I first got to know him at the Nürburgring in the in the 60s uh, I, I was driving a Mini Cooper and he broke and so I was hanging around the paddock and uh, I'd met him briefly somewhere and uh, he was driving for Abarth and he said to me that uh, I forget who it was he was driving with but th the other guy wasn't doing very well and he right. said would I be interested to drive with him so he took me off to see I think Avidano was the manager and uh, and I shared the uh, the Arbath with uh, Rolf at the Nürburgring and then I did it a couple of other races for Arbath afterwards but uh, so Rolf and I went back we were very similar age I think almost exactly the exactly the same age and uh, we we sort of followed each other you know through touring cars and through uh, GT cars and sports cars right. and uh, it, it was it, it wasn't in fact and in fact until the weekend where he died I didn't drive with him again after Arbath. I was always okay. against him, raced against him uh, yeah. with, uh, with the George Lowe's teams and the 935s and, yeah. and he was always the guy to beat. I mean, he was, he, he was outstandingly fast. Uh, but uh, when I was running my own cars, I was running three cars at, uh, at Riverside and uh, the team that he was driving for weren't going to that race and I found that out. and and gave him a call and said, would you like to come and drive with us? And he did, and tragically that was yeah. his last race. And yeah. I've always, he's got a reputation of being a joker as well, of being the man who would make everyone laugh and make everyone well, he, play yeah, jokes on people. He, he was just, a, yeah, he was a very amusing guy. Uh, uh, I can't say that one particular thing stands out in my mind, but right. generally he was just a nice guy to be with. Yeah. And he just was super fast. And of course, he was incredibly fast when they introduced the 917 at Le Mans. You know, I, th I believe he did the fastest lap at night in the 917. And he was uh, on pole as well, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was. And yeah. he was incredibly fast in that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we miss him. We miss him a lot. Uh, uh, you know, he was, he didn't have, he wanted to do Formula One, but never managed to get into the right car. And of course, he had that bad accident at Barcelona, yeah. which didn't help him. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have great fond memories of Rolf. Yeah, he's kind of one of the the best Porsche drivers that people often overlook, isn't he? So, in a way, when they yeah. think of the best. Well, I'm, you know, he's not around and people overlook him. But yeah, he was absolutely. Yeah, for me, he was the fastest of, of everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, that that day at Riverside with the three cars, uh, I'd got I'd got the car there that he was down to drive, which was the car we'd built for Le Mans the year before. Uh, the Yo sort of Moby Dick, yep. as they call it. I'd got my own K4 there, and and where we'd run the two together, the the K4 was always that little bit faster. Right. And Ralph came to Riverside two or three days early, and uh, I sent the cars up there, and he just worked and worked and worked on the Moby Dick. And by the time he'd finished with it, it was a bit quicker than the yeah. K4. In fact, Ralph and I started the race. He went into the lead, and I had I worked really hard to keep up with him. Really, and just you know, I did keep up with him, but <laughs> he, I was driving a lot harder than he was. Yeah. I'm um, talking about the 935. I think you are you have the most wins in the 935 out of all of the people that drove them. Yeah, uh, someone someone told me that i don't know the name hey, i think it was in our magazine a couple of years ago oh, okay. i think yeah Gar probably gary watkins ah who, right uh, oh gary would know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so what's the best 935 was it the moby dick 935 or? well uh for me the best the best one was was the k4 i mean uh, the moby dick worked at riverside because it's a long straight it's a very fast circuit but on the shorter tracks the k4 was it had a lot of downforce and we won some races at quite twisty tracks like mid-Ohio, places like that, which were quite tricky. Right. Uh, so, uh, and we developed the K4. I bought the car from Kramer, right. uh, and it didn't work very well at all. But my guys, we took it to the workshop in San Diego, and my guys, led by uh, uh, Max Crawford, who is a New Zealander, who went on to form Crawford Composites, uh, he was a great guy and I had some really really good guys my engine guy Mark Popoff Dadiani he was terrific Glenn Blakely they used to work for Gurney and I had some terrific guys out there and uh, 
I mean, Glenn Blakely sadly passed away, but Glenn Blakely, you, you give him a sheet of metal and he'd make anything. Really? Whatever you wanted him to make, give him a piece of metal and he'd do it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they completely rebuilt the K4. So it didn't really bear much resemblance right. to when we bought it. Uh, but for me, it was a fabulous car. It seems, was it more refined than it kind of maybe looked? Because when I think of a 935, I think of a big hulking Porsche, which you're sort of always fighting with. But I'm not sure that was the case. It was, it was more f refined and there was a bit of finesse to it. Well, yeah, it w I mean, we, we had quite a lot of downforce on it and we changed, we changed v virtually everything on it. I mean, the suspension, everything. Uh, and he had a lot of power. I yeah. mean, we, we had our own dyno, and uh, in fact, the dyno we got uh, wouldn't register how much power we got if we got too much power for the dyno. <laughs> but uh, we, we, had, uh, we had at least 900 horsepower from the 3.5 wow. engine on full boost. Uh, so it was, a, it was a handful, but it was a nice handful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you nearly won Le Mans with it in 1980, you and Brian Redman. Could the, uh, the sort of the one that well got away. Well, that was the the Dick Bar the Dick Barber K3. Yes, we uh, we uh, we did fastest lap in practice. We Not were on, on pole. On pole, it, it rained the first few hours. Uh, I think uh, eventually it was won by the Rondo. Yes, with uh, Jean Rondo Jean and, and Henri yeah. Scarolo. Uh, but we led it until about I think it was five six o'clock in the morning, and then we de developed a bit of a misfire, and uh, we, we finished. In the end, we won the class, but I mean, you know, I've, I've won the class a few times at Le Mans, yeah. but if you don't pass the line first, <laughs> if you don't win overall at Le Mans, then you forget the class wins. Really? They don't mean that much. No, because it's the one race that, in a way, that was missing from your CV, isn't it? The, you've got the, the C yeah, ring I wins. I, and I, I never won Le Mans. I'd love to have won Le Mans. Uh, I led it, led it on various occasions and had problems, but... Uh, I won my fair share of other races. Yep. I think most of the other long distance races I won at one time or another. Yep. Uh, so uh, I can't really complain. And at Watkins Glen, um, you won without a door in the 935. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Around the last pit stop, there was a sudden. Uh, Tran Hazeman's brought the car in. And uh, uh, there again, it had been pouring with rain again. And he came in and skidded a little bit and uh, had to put the brakes on really hard to avoid a photographer and as he came in the pits he'd got the door open ready to get out so he didn't have trouble right. and of course at, when he braked really hard the door flew out of his hand and they're only fiberglass those doors and it flew right the way open broke off the hinges and went scooting down the, down the down the pit road you know somebody uh, one of the marshals came back with the uh, door and they wouldn't let me leave without the door on uh, so he came back with the door and they taped it on with duct tape and all that sort of thing and off I went and I had a, quite a battle with Rolf in, in fact. Rolf was driving Dick Barber's car right. and uh, I was I, I was about, I, I forget exactly but you know 10, 15, 20 seconds behind Rolf and uh, eventually caught him and it was really difficult to get past and uh, just before I was going to uh, I was behind him on the straight slipstreaming and just something to do with the air on the door but it pulled the door off all the tape came off and suddenly there I was without the without the door and eventually I I overtook him on the inside at the very fast right hander at the end of the straight where he had to back off a bit and I got down the inside and we were really together close together and I got no door and his front right <laughs> wheel was just touching the sill you know about that far from my leg uh, yeah. so that was uh, another another interesting episode. But yeah. that was Rolf again. <laughs> I had some great races with Rolf. And then I think two years later, you're the Br first ever Briton to win IMSA. A year before Brian Redman did it. Yeah, I won IMSA in '80. I went over th there. In fact, I'd been at Bathurst in Australia the, uh, the, uh, the the September before, and I bumped into Dick Barber there, who I'd met briefly because of beating his car at Watkins Glen. Right. <laughs> And we got chatting and he asked if I'd like to go and do the IMSA championship for him. He was making a big effort. He got sack sponsorship and, and uh, he was buying a new car from Kramer. Uh, so I did. I moved to San Diego, uh, drove his car. We won, we won most of the races that yeah. year and uh, won the championship. Uh, 
and that was all down to Dick Barber. It was fantastic. Yeah, and then then came John Fitzpatrick Ra Patrick Racing as well. Yes, unfortunately, at the end of that year that I won the, that I won him, sir, uh, Dick uh, closed the team. He he got a few business problems and decided not to run uh, race team anymore, and uh, Sachs wanted to continue. So I decided to take the, you know, the step of forming my own team, which I did in San Diego. Had a workshop. Sax supported me, and uh, it was uh, it it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And we had one or two little problems. I didn't do as well that year, but we won some races. And uh, event uh, during the year, I uh, uh, Max Crawford, the New Zealander. Uh, join me with another guy from New Zealand and we gradually built the team up. It's almost like a something out of Hollywood, the story of your team. The way that it began with one phone call and then how obviously how it ended and it's <laughs> Well it was. I mean it, it, it basically well my American side of my team sort of more or less ended in tears. Yeah. Because we had this uh, sponsor who was an incredibly generous sponsor. Uh, as a, it was a Porsche enthusiast, a, a real Porsche nut, he loved Porsches. And uh, he approached me to, to sponsor the team. Uh, and uh, and we, we, did, we did very well with him, we, we won a lot of races with him. And uh, eventually it turned out he was like a mini Madoff. He was, he was running a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And uh, they took him away and locked him up, so that was the end of our sponsorship. And he wasn't great at watching, was he? He wasn't good at... No, he. <laughs> I know what you're referring to there. <laughs> in fact, he he hardly. I think he only ever came to two races. Right. The one race he came to was at uh, Lime Rock, and he, you never saw him without a pinstripe suit on. And uh, I mean, we'd sort of given up on expecting him to come to the races, right. but suddenly at Lime Rock he turned up. He'd chartered a plane from San Diego over to to Connecticut. And uh, he turned up in the paddock on the on the on the Saturday morning, uh, got out of this big stretch limo <laughs> with his pinstripe suit, and so I said, "Hey, John, how's it going?" And as if you know, it was all quite normal, which of course it wasn't. Uh, and uh, during the race, he was in our pit, and it's Lime Rock. The, the facilities are fairly basic there, you know, there's no covered pits or anything like that. And, but he was with our group in the pits. And during the race, I was leading, and I was leading from John Paul Jr. And we came up, I came up to, uh, to lap his father, John Paul Sr., right. uh, who made it really difficult for me to overtake, weaving on the straight and all that sort of thing. And after a couple of laps, my sponsor, Jerry Dominelli, his name was, he, uh, I don't know, I was in the car, so I didn't see it happen, but uh, he grabbed this wrench and went running, <laughs> running towards the, uh, the track and hurled the wrench at, at John Paul Sr.'s car. And of course the officials dragged him away and we were, my mechanics were worried that uh, he was, uh, you know, they were going to take us out of yeah. the race, but they didn't. <laughs> I mean, he just ran towards sort of screaming I won't say what he was screaming <laughs> but it wasn't nice and uh, so that was an, another interesting uh, yeah. event so were you in the 956 then or was that the 935 no that was 935 then yeah because you took delivery of the well, first it was the K4 actually right it was okay, the K4 so yeah. John Paul would have been in a, a he in was a 935 in a 935 well. and uh, John Paul Jr was in a Lola GTP car right and also I think Danny Angaios and Ted Field were in the Lola GTPs. Because right. when the Lola GTP came in 81, uh, uh, Brian was driving that for Lola. Yeah. And uh, it was quicker than the 935s. And after two or three races, when he developed it, he, he went on to win and he won the championship. And then I, my sponsor, who I got at the end of that year, he didn't want to buy a Lola, he didn't want to buy a, G he wanted a Porsche. So that's when we bought the K4 from Kramer and started to work on it ourselves so we could beat the GTP cars. Right. And in fact, we did. Uh, the K4, we then started to beat the GTP cars. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then you took delivery of the first customer 956. And I think, I think you yeah. stand, you were the only person to win in America in a 956, which sounds like, sounds, sounds wrong, but because it was a can -Am race that you won, I believe. Yeah, it was. That was an interesting situation because the, for, f for two or three years, uh, Porsche had been w winning in IMSA. 
and uh, John Bishop, who ran him, sir, he uh, quite rightly wanted to promote some other types of cars. So uh, when the uh, hit, and he'd promoted the the building of the GTP car and Brian right. ran the championship, but then Porsche developed the 956, and w I was going to buy one and bring it to IMSA. Uh, John Bishop decided he wasn't going to let the 956 run because he didn't want the right. 956 beating the, you know, it was f fair enough. He would had a Porsche domination. Uh, so he made a, he decided that various, one or two things on the 956 uh, uh, weren't going to be allowed. What he didn't bargain for, of course, was that Porsche then built the 962, which incorporated all those changes right. that he wouldn't allow. <laughs> You know, they took all those out. So then the 956, the 962 went to IMSA, which he couldn't stop it then. And of course, the 962 won it a lot in IMSA. Yeah. But we'd, uh, because uh, the, he wouldn't let the 956 run in IMSA, uh, the SCCA, Sports Car Club of America, contacted me to see if uh, I'd be interested to run in the Can Am. And uh, towards the end of the season, they invited me to do two races with the Can Am cars so we took the 956 uh, over and we went to Mossport I think I was third at Mossport and then at Elkhart Lake I put it on pole and actually won the race in front of uh, uh, Villeneuve in the oh, really? I, forget what, I think he had a frisbee I think it was right. yeah. uh, and, and of course all the Can-Am guys they weren't very happy about that either right. so that was the end of that but, but I did win a Can-Am race with it yeah. and it was the only race that Nine five six one in the stage. Yeah, yeah. it's a remar remarkable stat, I think. But to be only one win for yeah. nine five six. Yeah, uh, probably um, was. A, uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about it like no. that. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously came um, nineteen eighty three with your win with Derek Warwick um, at Brands. Yeah, we ran uh, we ran the whole season with the uh, nine five six. Uh, in fact, uh, w we bought the 956, and uh, my s a sponsor, this uh, Dominelli, who was still going at that time, he was very keen that we ran it in the World s uh, right. Championship, which we did. Uh, so we ran against the Rothman cars, and we'd uh, w we had one or two good races. We had a few little problems, but then at uh, at, and David Hobbs was driving with me for the whole season. Yes, uh, and we'd had one or two results, but then. For the race at Brands Hatch, David couldn't do it because he was doing Trans Am in America right. and was going to win the championship, which he did eventually. So it, it, uh, Chevy, Chevrolet didn't want him to miss that. Yeah. So uh, I asked Derek Warwick to drive with me. Derek had driven a 956 at Spa for Kramer and he'd gone very well. And uh, so I was looking for a driver for that. So I asked Derek to drive with me. And uh, and he did, and it was it was a really wet race. Uh, we had one or two little tweaks on the car. We also had Goodyear tyres on the car, and we had Derek in the car, and uh, we beat the Rothmans cars fair and square. Yeah, which was uh, I put a lot of pressure on me because <laughs> Derek started and led the race and had handed over to me with quite a lead. So it made me work hard to get yeah, to do that. Well. But it was fantastic and. And Derek always speaks about it. Derek, uh, Derek actually says that it was partly responsible for getting him his uh, a Renault Formula oh, One really? drive. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so uh, that that's a really good memory. I think he's here tonight, so you can uh, oh, yeah. ask him about it then. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we always talk about it. Anyway. <laughs> we, had, we did have a question from Ford Prefect, a reader, um, presumably a Hitchhiker's Guide fan, who said uh, he was at that day. What do you? What are your main memories from it, apart from the conditions? You had some tricks on the card, didn't you? Was it? Or you mastered some tricks? Yeah, we did. We had a, a, a my New Zealander mechanics, uh, Max and his guys. They came up with uh, a little tweak, which helped a lot. The the, uh, the problem with the uh, with the 956 was that although we had these uh, uh, tunnels, these downforce, you know, which create a lot of downforce, it sealed off the engine completely. And right. being partly air cooled, if if the engine was sealed completely. Uh, it overheated, and there were little, uh, some little slots in these, uh, uh, in the tunnels, uh, and if you open the slots, it let more air into the engine. So during the race, you open these slots, it let more air into the engine, and the the engine was fine. In qualifying, you could seal seal the slots off. So for two or three laps, it didn't matter if it got a yeah. little bit warm, but it made about us. 
it certainly made a second and a lap, a second a lap difference, which is quite a lot. Especially around brands. Yeah, it doesn't sound a lot, but no. it is quite a lot. Uh, my guys came out up with a system where, and they came up with it for that race, uh, where we could keep the slots closed and still have enough air to keep the engine cool. Right. And so we had a, we did have a slight advantage. Derek had it, uh, Derek put it on pole anyway, and we did have a slight advantage. And this, it, it really, Porsche were very puzzled about it. Norbert Singer, who was the, the main man yeah. at Porsche, he was very troubled about it. And he <laughs> thought it was probably the Goodyear tires, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't wet in practice, so it no. couldn't have been the Goodyear tires. And uh, after the race, uh, my guys had actually got the, uh, they got the engine cover off. And Norbert came along, and of course he was, he congratulated us, and he was fabulous. I mean, he, okay, we'd beaten him, but he was he was very sporting about it. And uh, he took a look in the back of the car, and he looked, and he smiled at me, and uh, I didn't have to say anything, and he didn't have to say anything, but he knew exactly what we'd done. Brilliant. And he sort of, uh, you know, he without saying anything he sort of congratulated us on yeah. it yeah wow uh, so that was great not many people can um get one over norbert singer on the well, engineering stakes no, when when i bought the uh, 956 we had it uh, flown over to san diego and we took it to riverside to test it and to uh, uh to whispering palms as well and norbert came out and he stayed with me in san diego for two or three days and he came to the track and tested with me and explained the car to me and told me all about it and he'd been fabulous with yeah. us and he, in fact one thing that sticks in my mind is uh, the first time i drove the car was at riverside and i went out and i did about eight or nine laps getting used to it and came in and i could hardly keep my head up straight <laughs> the g-forces i'd never experienced yeah. it before like that and uh, so i had to work a lot on my uh, my, my neck muscles yeah and then was it 83 you had your crash at Fuji, which then kind of made you stop racing. Looking back, do you think that you went too early in the in the retirement? Well, it, it, that, it wasn't the crash that made me stop. I mean, I did drive yep. af after that, so it wasn't the crash that made me stop. The reason I stopped was uh, because of, uh, of Rolf being killed, right. and my wife was there, and uh, we got two very small children, and it affected her a lot, because we were all great friends, and I could see that if I carried on, there was a, it was unfair to have that sort of pressure right. on her. So that's really why I stopped. Uh, yeah. So I decided to stop at the end of the year regardless, which I did, and carry on running the team, yeah. which I did. And then you were, well, David Hobbs um, gave you a podium at Le Mans as well. David, yeah, that's right. I ran two. Uh, I, I then still had the, the sponsor in San Diego and uh, he was very keen to do well at Le Mans and we, we bought two cars and we had sponsorship from uh, Skull Bandit uh, but unfortunately during that season there was that's when uh, my sponsor had his problems so but we did have the Skull Bandit sponsorship and he did well and we were, we had uh, a third place at, at Le Mans uh, which was great yeah I got on the podium as the team owner <laughs> I'd uh, rather have been on there as a driver, but yeah. it's, it's better than nothing. Yeah, and we were talking in the, office, in the office recently how people still love that delivery on that Skull Bandit car. It looked great, went it, great. It was a very impressive livery, it really was. It's, yeah. The basic colour scheme was, although it was green, it was actually based on my 956, the blue colour scheme. It was based on that, but then with the, the, with the Skull Bandit logos, it was amazing. Yeah. So I think we may have run out of time um, and because of a lot to do tonight and uh, a lot of people to see. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, That's a pleasure. Been on the list for a I long time. I enjoy remembering it all. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be back um, soon, I think. There might be a keep, out, keep an eye out for a best of podcast. And um, yeah, we'll see you again soon. Thank you again, John. I thank you, Al. Thank you. Great design is not only how things look, but also how well they work. The new GLC Urban Edition, now from £349 per month for a limited time only.